for today's meeting. Um, therefore, most of our members will be um, appearing via video link as well as our witness. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's assembly webpage. Um, members can mute their tablets by pushing F4 on their device. Um, so we have apologies this morning from Stuart who is still, still um, recuperating. Uh, and I think also Christopher, if Mr. Duncan can yeah, confirm. Yeah. Yeah. And also from Christopher. Thank you. Um, so moving on then to item number four, which is our oral briefing from the Small Business Commissioner. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page four of your packs. There's correspondence from the Office of, office of the Small Business Commissioner at pages eight and nine. There's a copy of a BES duty to report on payment practices and performance um, report on page 10. Um, and, and so if we... Come welcome to the meeting this morning, uh, Mr. Philip King, who's the Small Business Commissioner. So if we bring Mr. King into the spotlight, we should be able to see him. <coughs> and there we are. Yeah. Can you hear us, Mr. King? I can hear you, yes. Apologies for keeping you waiting. We were having some slight technical issues just um, <laughs> before we got kicked off. So um, if you would like to make an opening statement and then we'll invite members to, um, to ask some questions. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you for the opportunity of briefing you this morning. Um, and also thanks to Michael Greer for all his help in getting this morning organized for us and getting me to hit, sit before you. Uh, my name is Philip King. I'm currently the interim small business commissioner um, based in Birmingham um, for the whole of the UK. Uh, and I've been in post since the end of January. The brief of the small business commissioner is to resolve payment disputes between large and small businesses and to tackle unfavorable payment practices. We do that in three distinct streams of activity. The first is that we offer advice um, and signposting to small businesses who contact us via the telephone or through our website. Um, and I have a team of caseworkers who will deal with them um, where we can, we advise them directly, where we can't, we uh, refer them and signpost them to other services. The second aspect of our work is where we get directly involved in disputes and non-payment, where my caseworkers will talk to large businesses, um, establish why they haven't paid and encourage them to pay. Um, and so far we've collected 7.2 million pounds through that activity. Um, and since COVID-19 lockdown, we've collected over half a million pounds dealing directly with large businesses on behalf of smaller ones. And as part of that activity, we identify poor payment practice in particular um, and have the um, legal right to uh, make non-binding recommendations on businesses about how they can improve their payment practice um, and publish reports naming them um, and the findings that we have made. When we publish those reports, we then follow up with the businesses concerned um, and make sure that they have improved their payment practice and implemented the recommendations that we agreed with them on the publishing of the report. And I can give you some examples of those later if you want them. And the third aspect is changing the payment culture um, and driving change in payment culture to where paying on time becomes the norm rather than the exception. The prompt payment code, which was launched um, in 2008 by uh, Peter Mandelson when he was business secretary was hosted by the organization for which I used to work, the Chartered Institute of Credit Management. <laughs> the administration has now been moved across to the Small Business Commissioner's Office um, and we are driving the activity for that and currently reviewing the governance and a number of other aspects around it. The other aspect of changing payment culture is talking to large business so during lockdown, I've been running numerous webinars with all sorts of organizations, um, including the IOD, Chambers of Commerce, um, EY um, in Northern Ireland, where I've been running webinars for them. Um, and we've seen some really good engagement and activity. And where we see good behavior by large businesses, I write to them on behalf of the small business community and thank them. Where we see poor behavior, I write to them and 
ask them for a conversation. And I've had numerous conversations with large business chief exec and chief financial officers over recent weeks. And in almost every case, we've seen either a change in behavior or a flex in behavior so that small businesses are treated better. Um, and my premise for all of this and my motivation for all of this <clears throat> is that small businesses particularly suffer and through COVID-19, they're suffering even more than usual. We've seen the ONS statistics, we've seen the economy shrinking and so on. And small businesses are suffering as much, if not more than anybody else from financial issues in terms of lack of cash flow. Um, but I think one of the more important elements is the emotional impact of late payment on small businesses. I've talked to many over recent times who've told me about sleep deprivation, mood swings, eating disorders, relationship breakdowns, general well-being issues, and mental health problems, all caused by laying awake at night worrying whether or not payment is going to arrive. And I think it's really important that we get big business to understand the impact they can have on the smaller business community um, and the vulnerability of small business owners who are needing money to put food on the table. For them, it isn't rows on a spreadsheet, it's around getting food on the table and the money is very real. And the money we've collected in recent times ranges from a payment of £190,000 for a business, um, which was clearly very much needed, down to about £500 for a tiny micro business for whom <clears throat> that £500 was just as, as important as the nearly £200,000 for the other business I was talking about. It's really key that we help businesses get cash. And the reason I wanted to um, appear before this committee, originally, of course, in person, but now online, was because um, having been in post since the end of January, I want to make sure that we have an awareness of our services, which are free, by the way, um, across the whole of the United Kingdom. And I want to make sure that we engage adequately with the <clears throat> folks in Northern Ireland. And I want to do more in that respect. We've achieved some things with Northern Ireland um, organisations, Santander, the IOD, Chambers of Commerce, EY, I mentioned earlier. Um, we're doing some work with Barclays, Eagle Labs and their incubators and so on. But we want to do more. Um, and I want to uh, share with you this morning how we think together we might collaborate um, and support small business in Northern Ireland better. I'll hand over to you now for any questions you might have. Um, thank you very much for that um, and for, for giving us all of that background um, and I suppose it's a, a, an issue that we're probably all aware of um, and is highlighted quite often um, in terms of particularly small businesses um, and obviously there is um, practice being encouraged particularly from public sector um, organisations in terms of, of prompt payment um, but I wonder if you would maybe be able to give us some idea of how, what the um, the, the issue is like here in the north compared to maybe other um, parts of, of Britain? Well, I think we see peaks and troughs, but in general terms, um, I think what we see is that the issues small businesses face are the same wherever they are. We know that the <coughs> tech industry is thriving in Northern Ireland, um, and we know that there are substantial numbers of freelancers um, and self-employed um, and we know that freelancers and self-employed tend to suffer worse from late payment than small businesses that a have some resources to manage their cash flow better but b don't get treated in, in quite such a bad way as often freelancers do by large businesses so i don't i don't see any particular statistics around Northern Ireland being worse or better, but generically, I think it suffers from exactly the same um, as, as the rest of the UK. <clears throat> um, and in terms of, since you have come into the role, um, how do you, you feel the, the awareness of, of the role of the Small Business Commissioner is here um, with businesses? I know you've spoke there about some of the engagement that you have um, been doing, but do you think there is a general awareness or is there more to do in that respect? Um, I think the general awareness is far lower than it needs to be. 
Um, there's certainly a lot more we need to do. Um, I think that we are doing some work with organisations I've already mentioned, but there are many more that we haven't yet engaged with. Um, and I think we need to work much more closely with, for example, Invest NI to make sure that we're getting um, prominence and, and being seen. You know, ours is a free service, it's available, um, and it worries me and concerns me that not enough small businesses know about us and not enough are willing to pick the phone up or go on our website and use us. Um, we know that when we get involved, we do have a really big impact. Um, and if we could just get more awareness, that would be helped. And you, you um, mentioned that you have a legal right to make non-binding recommendations. Um, but what is the, I suppose, um, uptake of those recommendations by businesses? How uh, willing to, are they, you know, generally speaking, to engage and to implement um, if they're non-binding as such? <clears throat> well, I think the big issue for large businesses is reputation. Um, and when we name a business um, publicly, they get um, reputational damage and that worries them. And most large businesses, I won't say all, but most large businesses don't set out to damage their small business supply chain. It's not in their interest to do that. So very often the issues are more about um, effective administration than anything else. Um, one of our name published reports was... Um, Zurich Insurance. It related to um, a small um, motor workshop in Cookstown, uh, and we made recommendations about them. Um, I had a follow-up meeting with them <clears throat> a few weeks ago. Um, since our report, they have now moved to a point where they're paying more than 75% of their um, vendors electronically rather than by check and they've implemented some of the things that we recommended to make things slicker um, and they now one very simple thing they've done is to now make sure that suppliers have a named contact they can talk to and that's made available to them um, early in the relationship so I think we do see um, a real uptake and we follow up all our complaints and make sure that the recommendations are being implemented yeah, just in, re in relation to, to what you're saying there, maybe it would be useful if you could outline some of the, the poor practices, like if it is administrative issues or if there are you know, other, other particular issues. Well, through COVID-19, we've seen a real range. So we've seen some businesses doing incredibly good things to support their supply chains. And we've seen others who have sent out a blanket email to 2,000 suppliers and told them they're just not going to be paid until COVID is over. Mm. Where we've seen that, we've written to them. Um, I've engaged with some of them with the small business minister, Paul Scully, where we've talked to them um, and persuaded them to <clears throat> take a different view. And in many cases, I've had some quite informal conversations with businesses. I've got another one later this morning where we spell out to them the impact that they can have on their small supply chain um, suppliers. And what we've seen is that those businesses have recognised that and have, where they can, they have paid them faster. Where they can't, they've at least had conversations with them and agreed payment plans, <coughs> excuse me, or delayed payments. And we've seen some real conversations open up, which is really important. Um, I'm going to hand over to some of the members for questions and I, I want to bring into the spotlight um, Gary, Gary Middleton. Spotlight. Are you Gary? Hopefully you can hear me, yeah. Chair. Yeah. yeah, well, Philip can hear me anyway, that's the main thing. Uh, Philip, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a few, or well, two questions. Um, well, first of all, is how do uh, small businesses get in contact with your with your organisation? Do they is it via uh, telephone? Is it via email? Um, you know, how how do businesses become aware? I appreciate uh, all of the conversations that you've already had with uh, some of those key uh, stakeholders that you referred to, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, um, but 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 how else do you reach out to those people? I think it is an opportunity for you now to to clearly articulate that so that people can come forward as well. Okay, so good morning, Gary. Uh, yeah, we um, have a website, 
smallbusinessmissioner.gov.uk. On the contact button there, their phone number, excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> I'm joking. Um, yeah, our contact numbers are on the website. The, the, um, there's a form to contact us. So if they make contact with us, we will get, then get in touch with the small business. So phone numbers are there, email addresses are there, and so on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're having difficulty this morning with the with the mic. So I'll try and not maybe ask questions that, that will give you a huge amount of effort. But uh, I, I suppose as well around the around the issue of uh, good practice. Uh, I know that there, there's many businesses out there who who do good things, but uh, I think for yourselves, it's about ensuring that the small businesses, um, you know, get payments efficiently and all of that. Um, how then? How then do you once you uh, contact a larger business in terms of the initial conversation? If that doesn't go well, what then is the process? Where, where do you go after that? I appreciate there's the reputational uh, damage, but I'm, I'm assuming that some of these large organisations uh, may you know may, may not take great concern at that. You know, where, where would you go next for those small businesses? Well, if we get a formal complaint, then we can go down a formal complaint process, which means we publish a report and so on. But I have to say to you that I've written to um, around 35, 40 businesses since COVID started, <clears throat> and I haven't yet had a negative conversation. So I have seen, I've talked to CFOs and CEOs. They have been very supportive. They've been supportive, and one of the key things is that my team now has a name and details which we can go back to if we need to. So we have a personal contact, and we've done that a number of times. Okay. Uh, just a very final question, uh, Chair. It was just to ask in terms of your engagement with the Department for the Economy itself, um, how do you engage um, with the Department specifically? We don't sufficiently, okay. and we need to. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. I think we can explore that as a committee, maybe at a later stage. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gary. Um, can I bring Philip back into the spotlight? He's in Philip there. Philip just yeah. needs to stay in the spotlight. Um, Philip, do, do you need a, a wee break there for a drink or? No, I'm, I'm fine, I think. Come on, let's keep going. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I want to bring John Stewart into the spotlight then. Hi, Philip. Can you hear me? I can, John. Hi, good morning. Hope you're feeling a bit better there. Get some water into you while I speak. Hopefully you can answer my questions. Thank you so much for your briefing to date. Um, um, it's been very helpful. I am aware of the, the good work you've been doing um, as a small business owner, formerly myself, and a family-run business. I think I'm all too aware of how difficult it can be with, with larger um, companies that you deal with sometimes to get to get money out of them. And maybe not necessarily just getting it paid on time, but negotiating fair um, trading terms. And I do know that some big multinationals are still insisting on hideous terms like 90 days for small businesses. Is that something you're still seeing? And what can we do to try and bring that down? Because these are companies that can afford to, um, get, to, to offer better terms, but just choose not to because it's better for their bottom line. Ultimately, where the smaller trader just can't do that, but sometimes there's no choice because the offer of the business is too hard, too much to turn down. Uh, and secondly, um, I know when we were, on, I was on local government, um, we made a big effort, as did much of the public sector, to try and do as much to pay small businesses as quickly as possible. Does your remit extend to the public sector in terms of their ability to pay? And if so, how do you think public sector generally, both centrally and local government? Is doing and its ability to pet small business suppliers. Okay, so second second question first, if I may. I don't look after the public sector, no. Okay. I do know that the <coughs> that the um, cabinet office public procurement notice has been designed to push. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> don't worry. Take your time. I was doing that about ten minutes ago. <coughs> I do know that the public, public, the cabinet sector public procurement notice 
220 is driving public sector to do even better than normal, and that's working. In terms of large businesses dictating long terms, yes, we do see that. The, the prompt payment code sets a maximum of 60 days, and therefore we encourage businesses to sign up to that. And fundamentally, we are trying to educate small businesses to recognize they don't always have to accept the terms that businesses try to impose. Yeah. We're seeing more examples, and I'm using webinars to drive this particularly, where small businesses are standing their ground um, and finding that actually sometimes if they do have to accept longer terms, there's something in it for them, perhaps a bigger order or a long determination clause or something that's in their interest. And we need small businesses to be empowered to feel that they have the, the, the right to negotiate and to challenge. And, and part of my remit is to make sure that they have <clears throat> some support in doing that and recognize how they might do that. Thanks, Phil. No, that's been very helpful. Um, I think certainly during COVID-19, there's never been a more important time for a small business to have access to the money because cash is king at the minute and a lot of them just cannot get their hands on the money they need. So they need their the, the, their big customers to play ball and to get that money through as quickly as possible. So I've just shared your contact details as well on my Facebook page with all my followers. And hopefully any of the small businesses that are having difficulties can come by me to your office if they do need any assistance. So. Thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I want to bring into the spotlight then Sinead. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can. I can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, and as John said, um, cash is keen for small businesses. And we have seen through COVID how quickly um companies uh, can go down and go under without that immediate supply of cash within uh, within their their business and, and i have experience with that and in, in, uh, within the chamber of commerce where where um i previously worked where businesses actually went to the wall because of per payment uh, methods and i think one of the things that is wrong about <laughs> about our system is the fact that that even the toleration of, of a 90 day payment uh, is acceptable in any terms and conditions and I would go as far as to say 60 is far too long as well, particularly for, for small businesses. And, and, and you get into a system where small businesses are afraid to speak up mm. because they're frightened that they'll lose the, the customer or the client and there's kind of a, like a, a, an underbelly of, of kind of bullying. <clears throat> That can happen uh, within supply chains, uh, and the smaller uh, the business is, the, the, the more they're squeezed, uh, and we do see that quite a bit. Uh, and I think that you know there is a reluctance sometimes to complain uh, and, and, and to go to organisations or to go to the commissioner because they're afraid um, that they will be just cut out of, of the system. Um, how do, how do you combat that type of uh, supply chain bullying? Uh, you know, I'm particularly aware. Um, some larger supermarkets um, can have this type of practice as well and, and it really does um, drive the smaller business uh, into the ground very quickly. Sinead, thank you, that's a good question. I think that we... Um... <coughs> Take your time, uh, Philip. I have no idea what's happening this morning, but anyway. Um, yeah, I think there is a <coughs> there is a reluctance on small businesses to complain. They can complain anonymously, so we can follow up a complaint without knowing, sharing the name of the business with the large customer, which I think is important. And certainly in the current climate, the letters I'm writing to chief execs are completely anonymous. So I will write on the back of any intelligence I receive, any press report I see, anything I hear from anybody, and just say, we've heard something, can we have a conversation, please? And what I found is that that conversation often leads to a change in practice without anyone doing anything because the business is concerned about its reputation. Why are those small businesses to talk to us, <clears throat> even if they don't want to be named, and we can 
deal with that anonymously. And if they hear anything, then let us have that intelligence. And that goes for politicians, please, as well. Let us have intelligence and we will pick up and write to businesses and have conversations with them. This is not a, you know, there's no silver bullet for this. We have to gradually work through this stuff and improve it. So every step we make is, a, is an incremental step in improving the situation. And you're right, there are some um, egregious examples of how businesses behave. Um, and we see that, we do call it out, um, and increasingly so. But I think the, the key thing is it's around culture change, getting businesses to pay on time as the norm, and recognizing the strength of their supply chain when they support it. And I would say that in my experience, payment of invoices is an articulation of the relationship between the supplier and the buyer. And where I see a business that pays well, they also treat those suppliers well in all sorts of ways and treat them as partners. And for me, that's where we need to get to so that businesses work together and see themselves as partners with a common aim, which is both making a profit, both delivering better services and products and so on, um, and working together. And, and it's, no, it's no surprise that the, business, the businesses that pay best um, have the most the happiest supply chains because they treat them well and often the happiest employer, employees as well because they treat their employees and their values as such that the business is, is done in the right way. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Gordon? Thanks very much, Philip. And we uh, sympathise with you. Obviously, you have a difficulty there with your voice. <laughs> we'll not delay you too long. Um, Thank you. Do you have a presence, a physical presence in Northern Ireland or, or staff that you can avail with to engage with people locally? That's my first question. Number two is just what authority do you have? We appreciate you make recommendations and um, you want obviously businesses um, to comply. If, if they don't comply, what real sanctions can you take? So, no, we don't have a presence in Northern Ireland, <coughs> sadly. But we do have contact with all the organisations I talked about. And we use those as routes to market. I would be very happy to send someone over to Northern Ireland regularly once lockdown's over to <clears throat> have a presence, perhaps run a surgery in, in Belfast or somewhere in conjunction with um, Invest NI or another organisation. So I think that's something we could do. In terms of sanctions, we have limited sanctions. There's a consultation coming out later this year, which will be talking about increasing the powers of the office. Currently, our sanctions are limited. <clears throat> we are making non-minding recommendations, um, and there, is, there are moves that suggest we should have much stronger powers, and those will be mooted in the, in the consultation coming out later in the year. Great, thanks very much. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Gordon. Um, John? Thank uh, Philip, thank you uh, for your presentation and information. Uh, I was just, the, the agri-food sector is an important part of our local economy, and I'm just wondering in terms of your, your office's connection with uh, the agricultural industry, the agri-food industry, uh, and in particular that relationship between the large supermarkets and that supply chain. Uh, are, does your commission work in that arena? Uh, yes, John. Good morning. We do work in that arena, but not specifically. Um, and we don't have any. I don't have any data that suggests the um, agriculture industry is suffering more than any other particular sector. But it's one of the sectors we cover. We have made recoveries um, in that sector and uh, are very happy to engage in it. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It has been really informative um, and we're going to pick up on some actions here. I'm just going to ask the, the members um, if they will agree to a few things um, and uh, we'll do our best to, to share information about the, uh, your office um, with our network as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if we take Philip out of the spotlight then, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Back yep. into so everybody else will come back in. If we bring the other members into Spotlight so we can see them all. Okay. There we are. There we go. Perfect.
Okay. Um, so we were going to propose right to invest and also to FSB at Enterprise NI. Um, anybody else that anyone wants to suggest basically to highlight the role of the, the commissioner um, and ask them to engage with their members? Chair, if we, if we go out to, we've got a fairly wide group of stakeholders now, if yeah. we go out to all our stakeholders, mm -hmm. but also, um, as, as Mr Stewart's done, push out the Commissioner's contact details and, and a bit of background on them on our social media as well, because um, that, that has a fair amount of pick up and then if members recirculate that themselves. Um, and Chair, also potentially what Mr King had suggested about some kind of, um, run some kind of surgery locally. Yeah. Um, I, I would imagine, um, he had suggested invest, mm -hmm. but I would imagine any of those stakeholders would be more than happy to host that. Yeah. Um, whether we do it in a, a virtual current type of way or we plan forward and try and do it physically later on, but we can, we can liaise on that if members are content. Yeah. 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 I think Chair is obviously very relevant at the moment with COVID and you know small businesses and the lack of production and the lack of retail and activity. So there are obviously a lot of debts out there that need to be settled. So any help people can get, I think, would be welcome. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Chair, I want to show you also write to the DR committee just to highlight the role of the, of, of uh, Mr. King's work to the DR committee. There's a lot of small businesses in the, the agri food industry and even agriculture. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. We can still see the members. Uh, it's just yeah, they're on. not on my screen, so I'm going to just see what I can see. Do you want to come in, John? Sure. Uh, yeah, I just put my hand up. Wasn't sure what the etiquette was, Chair. Um, I agree with John on his last point, and I think you further to that, just on the point I was raising about maybe our local and central government around procurement. Um, could we maybe get an update by the, the development department to see how each of our 11 councils are performing in terms of their commitment to, to pay all suppliers in Northern Ireland in a timely fashion and in those terms and what the current boundaries are that each of them are trying to adhere to? Because it would be wrong of us, I think, to call on big companies to do it and then find out subsequently that we weren't all um, living up to that. I'm confident that we are, but I'd like to just see it in paper, if possible. Yeah. Absolutely, sure. Yeah, members are happy we can do that. Um, I know uh, across the departments, Chair, the executive has um, done work on this before. I can recall years ago working in mm. DFP and they were doing this. Um, and, and it is protocol across government departments and ourselves here in the Assembly to pay within a, a certain time scale that's most helpful to small businesses, I think. Um, a maximum of 30 days, but preferably within that time. Um, and a lot of work has gone into the sorts of electronic payment systems that Mr. King was suggesting. I know here we have quite a lot of electronic systems that we use to um, increase payment times or reduce payment times, sorry, I should say, to suppliers that we have. Um, I think most um, departments in the executive would be exactly the same. Okay, well, moving on. Okay, so moving on then to item number 10, which is any other business. Um, members will have received a draft motion on extending the membership of the Minister's Economic Advisory Group at page three of table uh, papers. Um, I would like to seek unanimous agreement from members that they agree to the motion that has been drafted there in your path um, as members are agreeable. Chair, I think we'll note this one. The, uh, no, I don't think I would be in agreement with it, to be honest. Uh, I think we've, we've sort of touched on it before. As far as I can see, um, the economy, Economic Advisory Group is a high-level group looking at identifying future opportunities in the global economy. Uh, the previous um, format of this group, we didn't have uh, those mentioned bodies within it, and it seemed to work effectively and efficiently. And uh, yes, there there are um, opportunities for groups like trade unions certainly to to have an input, but I don't believe they necessarily need to be included at this stage within the this high level group. So I would be opposed to your your proposal. Any other members, chair? Does any other members want to come in? 
Sinead. I am um, just in, in relation to the, the the motion. I still think that the remit um, of um, the advisory group has to clearly state um, they will seek um, to to um, have sub regional. Uh, equalities in there because it's really really important we've seen a lot of inequality particularly over COVID for example uh, broadband uh, and rural um, inequality so you know any economic advisory group should have sub-regional um, targets uh, within the context of it I wouldn't be uh, against the motion at all um, I would be quite happy for that um, to go forward uh, but I do think that it, it probably needs a, a little more additionality in re, in regarding the equality and the reach out and, and um, some sectors as well. John Dowd. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think the motion is timely in the fact that there has been a widespread, or I mean widespread in terms of across different sectors and, and political points of view in relation to the makeup of the economic advisory group. I will take on board Gordon's comments about what happened in the past, but I think we are going to have to do things differently if we are going to climb out of the, the economic hole which COVID-19 has created, and this is a, an opportunity to do that, so uh, I think it is timely. Uh, in relation to Sinead's comments around regional uh, unbalance, I am open to persuasion on an amendment to it, if, if Sinead has any words to that effect, but uh, I think in terms of the motion it is it's it's, it's timely. Um, Gary, I think you've been looking in there as well. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, I would agree with Gordon's point. Um, you know, this this was raised with the minister last week, um, around the fact that you know this this economic advisory group, the the, the focus really of this group is to try and build and, and solidify the current position that we have as world leaders in some of those industries, the, the fintech sector um, you know, uh, uh, and, and our financial services, all of those sectors. It's really about trying to build on that. Uh, some of the other areas which have been mentioned, you know, Chair, I do agree with you. I think that it is important that their voices are heard, but I think that there's an opportunity for other forums uh, to do that. Um, Sinead's point around the, the the imbalance and making sure that all parts of Northern Ireland benefit, I think that point's well aired at every meeting uh, by all uh, committee members, I think, and, and it should be aired, so I'm not criticising that for one second, uh, but I wouldn't get hung up in, in trying to, to include that in a committee motion. Um, as important as it is, I don't think that, that, that we, we need to do that, uh, attaching it to this particular motion, but I, I would raise concerns about bringing all of these groups in together, um, I think it would then, then lose focus. Um, so, so I think that's just the same my view on it. Okay, is there any... Just, just to ask John. John Stewart, are you wanting in at all? Yes, Chair. Um, I, I, I do recognise that some of the value in the motion, I raised this last week myself, and I was disappointed not to see um, a broader representation on the advisory group, um, particularly around from social enterprise, for example, I think which we all recognise as an important role to play in our economy. And while, yes, some will say that those who are already on it could champion it, I made the point that no one can champion a sector like representatives from the sector. But I think what I am conscious of is just how, how vast this could get. I mean, it's quite a broad, I mean, it, the motion doesn't even say how many representatives or how far that will go. I'm just trying to get it up here. But uh, I mean, in terms of, I just think it could get quite overwhelming. And I wouldn't be adverse to maybe um, maybe the terms of reference being changed that they would seek um, input from like sectors from academia or from trade unions and, and, and that sort of thing. But just to have almost a free for all where everybody's in, I think it could get far too clustered. So perhaps if we could maybe, instead of having something completely binding at this stage, maybe put a request in to even feed into the process and ask that it, that they look at the membership again um, and widen it out, or else make a commitment that there is significant input throughout that from the other sectors that you refer to. I'm just, I am concerned about how big it could get. Okay, thank you, uh, John. And um, I think to just to, to be clear, it, um, we, we, we recognise the, the expertise of those who have been appointed to the Economic Advisory Group as, as it stands and um, the, the intent 
However, in terms of planning and economic recovery, it is going to address the real challenges we face at the minute that um, widen out the membership to bring in particularly the voice of trade unions representing workers, um, but also those other sectors that are really important to, to our local economy. Um, and I think that there is a role for those voices to, um, to feed into that and to shape what the economic recovery looks like. Um, and I think that that is something that we, need, we really need to address. Um, so Peter, how do we move Chair, forward? Chair, options here are um, if... If the Deputy Chair wants to make her amendment formal, we go on a, a vote on the amendment first. If that falls, then we vote in the original motion. If there's not a majority for the motion, the motion falls. Other alternatives, um, just from what members have said, potentially uh, looking at writing to the Minister to ask her to create a formalised mechanism. Gary wants back in there as well. Uh, create a formalised mechanism whereby there is a direct channel of communication to the additional stakeholders that have been flagged up by the motion or some variation of that so it's it's really for for committee to decide now how they want to take this forward um any motions with amendments will need voted on as well the main motion um or if members want to move to writing to the minister instead to seek established and formal channels of communication uh, with other stakeholders that's for the committee now to decide Jeanette, do you want to propose an amendment Oh, thank you, wants to come in there. Oh. Yeah, Gary's put it in. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hello. Yeah. 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 So my amendment is very simple. It's it's just tagging on at the very end that the remit of the economic advisory group should be expanded to include the need to address and correct Northern Ireland's sub-regional inequalities. Okay, so if we, sorry, if you want to let Gary come in, just sorry, you had raised your hand. Do you want to come in? Yeah, it, it was just to say, Chair, I, um, I don't doubt the, the value of what we're discussing. I just would have some concern that, you know, as we're sort of doing this on the hoof and we're, you know, we're throwing on amendments and all of that, and I think that uh, whilst I agree with um, Sinead's. Uh, sentiments and amendments and um, I, I think that we need to allow time to discuss this as well uh, maybe it may be a suggestion that um, we we uh, put this off until our Wednesday meeting uh, we look at a number of the options and um, the, the motion absolutely along with the amendment but also as, as Peter has alluded to the fact is that we could also or John has mentioned about maybe writing to the minister and getting a bit more clarity I think all the options should be on the table for Wednesday, and then we can come back and look at it, having properly uh, thought it through, rather than, as I say, just sort of on the hoof, if you like. John O'Dowd, are you looking in? Sinead, could I maybe suggest a, a, a slightly shorter amendment than your own, and uh, it maybe fits in with the context of the motion, uh, if you were open to that. So it would read... If you go from uh, this assembly acknowledges the scale of the depth of the economic damage as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, recognises the need to chart a strategy for economic recovery that addresses long-standing issues such as regional disparity, poor productivity and growth. So just, if you will include just in terms such as regional disparity. That, that works for me too, John. Thank you. So does that leave us then? Um, Deputy Chair, does that mean you're content with that amendment rather than wanting to move your own amendment? Or would because otherwise we would have to vote on two amendments if if we go to a vote. I don't know that Sinead can hear us. Sinead, can you hear us? Yeah, okay. yeah. So sorry. Sir, what, what, sorry, what I'm saying there is um are you content to stand down your amendment and support Mr O'Dowd's instead? If we come to a vote yeah, on that, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I think maybe rather than a regional disparities or a thing, I think imbalance yeah, okay. <laughs> is a better yeah. one, just call yeah. it what it is. But no problem with that. Thanks. Okay, so we have the option of, of voting on it now or bringing it back on Wednesday. Aye. With Thanks. an amended motion as, as along those lines. Sorry. Sinead? No, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm happy for it to go to a vote now, but if on Wednesday we had um, 
the terms of reference for the EAG group so that we could um, analyse just exactly what they all are because we haven't really seen them uh, in any detail or studied them in any detail. So, you know, we could bring the amendment to Wednesday and, and look at it in, in the round with the terms of reference. This is certainly the worst. Um, John Stewart? Yeah, Chuck, I mean, I, I agree with that. I agree with Gary's point about maybe bringing this back for a full discussion on Wednesday. I don't like to jump any gun and until we see those terms of reference, we don't really know what it is that we're we're dealing with here. That the terms of reference might be so extensive that they prioritize the regional imbalance in the Northern Ireland. They may have a key role for all the sectors that we outline in the motion. Um, I go back to my original point. The, the makeup of this group could almost double, just if we have one or two representatives from each of the bodies that are mentioned in it. I am not against that per se. But I do think it does need discussion and maybe not something done as quickly as this. And I think if we just set some time for it on Wednesday, if we have the terms of reference, I think it will lead to a much more informed and productive debate. John, no doubt. I'm just thinking of time scales. Um, Wednesday would mean that it won't go to the business committee until the following Tuesday and won't be discussed then until. So you're talking about potential for this if it is agreed by the committee. Uh, a debate a fortnight, at least a fortnight away. Um, and a lot of things can happen in a fortnight, and I think we just need to continue to press home the message that the, the advisory group needs to be expanded. Okay, I, I think that's actually a very fair point. Um, so I, I think then we'll, we'll go ahead and take a vote on it now. Um, okay. And so, Chair, this will work in two pieces. Tommy has his page ready for, for his voting sheet. Um, so what will happen is members understand it as is in the chamber, um, voting on the amendment first. And because we can see everybody, if, you, if we do it as a simple raising of hands, so can I see hands for supporting the motion as amended by uh, Mr. O'Dowd using the phrase that had been discussed with the deputy chair? Can I see hands for that? So we have the chair, the deputy chair, and Mr. O'Dowd. Can I see? Vote against that. So I've got Mr. Dunn against that. I've got Mr. Middleton against that, and Mr. Stewart against that. So that amendment falls because it's equal numbers. So if we go to the original motion, um, and can I see hands for the? Can I just check procedures? Oh Does the chair have a casting vote? No, not in not in committee. No. So if I go back to the original motion. Um, and I see hands for the original motion, for yes. So I have the chair, I have Mr O'Dowd. Have I any other hands for the original motion? No hands original. so I've got Mr O'Dowd on the chair. Can I see hands against the original motion? So I've got Mr Dunn, Mr Middleton, um, and Deputy Chair and Mr Stewart. Is Mr Stewart, you're voting against the original motion, yep. And Deputy Chair, how do you vote or do you wish to abstain? I would abstain it because at okay. this point then I, I, I think we bring everything back to Wednesday's okay. meeting and look at the terms of reference. So we have a Deputy Chair abstaining on that, so that motion falls. So if uh, members are want to or are willing, um, if you want to bring this back on Wednesday as an AOB, it'll go into tomorrow's table pack. And we seek the terms of reference um, from the department. And can we press upon them the urgency? Oh, absolutely. About they they'll understand there, there needs to be yep. a discussion on this, yep. so it'll absolutely have to come straight and away. That we will be wanting to discuss other options around it as well. Okay, are members content that we proceed on that basis? Um, discussion on Wednesday. We only have one briefing in for Wednesday, so there's there's time there for that. Okay. Um, I've been just noted here. Move on. Um, okay, so we're moving on then to item number 11, which is the date, time and place of our next meeting, which is um, in this room on Wednesday, the thir 24th of yes, June. Wednesday the 24th. No, we, we had a typo there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, members. And if you want to switch out now, and I will turn off. Okay, thank you. Bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.